Welcome to this episode of Mentors at Your Benchside, a podcast giving you advice, tips and tools for getting the most out of your research. I'm Thomas Warwick and today I'll be talking to you about the qPCR standard curve and why it's important. At first sight, qPCR looks like a very simple technique and when it's optimised it can lead to great results. However, to obtain consistent and accurate results that reflect what's really going on in your sample, good controls are crucial. One of these controls for qPCR is the standard curve. It enables you to check the efficiency of your primers. Designing and testing qPCR primers using a standard curve is an absolute must before doing any qPCR experiments. Making sure that the obtained CT values are valuable and reflect reality is an absolute must. After you receive your new primers, you're often impatient to run away and do your qPCR. Whether you designed the primers using bioinformatics software, came to Bitesize Bio for help, or chose a sequence already published, you can't guarantee your primers are good. Even if the melt curve results in a nice clean single peak, it does not indicate that the oligos are usable. They may still not amplify the target efficiently during a dose-dependent DNA amplification. Therefore, you should always check your primers with a standard curve. It ensures that your primers bind to amplify their target efficiently and precisely. To perform a qPCR standard curve, you set up your qPCR reactions to amplify different amounts of the same DNA sample. Theoretically, efficient primers will result in a linear dose response curve. And why it's called a curve when you get a linear result is a mystery to me, but we'll stick with it. To get a good standard curve, you ideally need at least five data points over several orders of magnitude, e.g. fivefold to tenfold dilutions. You then need to obtain your CT values, plot them on the y-axis, and then the number of the log of the copies of DNA per mil on the x-axis. Check out the corresponding online article for an example of a qPCR standard curve. You'll also want to run your samples in triplicate so you can assess the reliability of your results. To obtain precise results, do serial dilutions and prepare the same volume of DNA in every reaction. Use water instead of DNA as a negative control to detect contaminants in the reaction and to discriminate background amplification. Also, make sure your DNA sample is good quality. Intact DNA, appropriate concentration, and a good A to 60 to 80 ratio are all musts. Also, make sure your DNA sample is good quality. Intact DNA, appropriate concentration, and a good A to 60 to A to 80 ratio are all good things to double check. Analyzing your standard curve. Some qPCR software have applications to analyze your standard curve for you. It generates the curve and calculates the efficiency of the reaction. There are a few values you might want to calculate yourself, however. Number one, PCR efficiency. What do we mean when we talk about PCR efficiency? Under ideal conditions during PCR, the number of DNA molecules should double every cycle. This would give a 100% efficient reaction, which is what we're trying to achieve. Reactions are rarely so perfect, so acceptable ranges of efficiency are between 90 and 110%. You might be thinking, how can you have an efficiency over 100%? It is possible and it usually indicates polymerase inhibition. The inhibition will be strongest in the least diluted samples. As the samples are diluted, the concentration of the inhibitors is decreased and this can lead to efficiencies of over 100%. If you see efficiencies of over 100%, try diluting your samples more or omitting the high dilutions in the efficiency calculations. For values below 90%, you may have inhibitor contamination or poor primer efficiencies. How to calculate PCR efficiency. As said, many PCR software will calculate qPCR efficiency for you. But if you want to calculate it yourself, then you can use the following equation. Efficiency equals open brackets 10 to the power of negative one divided by the slope, close brackets minus one. Your answer will be a decimal. Multiply it by 100 to convert it to a percentage. Number two, the R squared value. The R squared value is the coefficient of correlation and it should be greater than 0.99 but less than 1 to provide good confidence within the correlation. This value lets you see if there is a good linear relationship between the values of each sample. A low value could indicate poor serial dilution. To avoid this, when making your serial dilutions, ensure you pipette accurately using well calibrated pipettes and mix your dilutions well. Any graph software such as Prism and Excel can calculate this for you directly from the standard curve. Number three, standard deviation for CQ values. Performing replicates helps reduce errors and make your R squared and PCR efficiency values more reliable. However, you won't get reliable value for these if your replicates vary too much. To check how reliable your replicates are, calculate the standard deviation. 
good replicates should be within 0.2 standard deviation units. If they're not, you may need to redo your standard curve. If you get nice data from your qPCR standard curve, you're well on your way to being satisfied with the efficiency of your primers. But what happens if your standard curve data are not so good? It happens surprisingly often that your qPCR standard curve results in something that's not a straight line. Each DNA concentration results in approximately the same CT value. This means that the primers do not recognize the target efficiently. If this happens to you, make sure your DNA sample is clean and does not contain contaminants. If your primers still do not amplify it efficiently, then design and order a new pair of primers. In the past, I've tried to troubleshoot inefficient primers to find appropriate parameters, such as concentration and annealing temperature, but in my opinion, this rarely leads to improved results. A poor standard curve may not be caused by inefficient primers. Your standard curve might be incorrect if your target is expressed poorly in your sample. You should verify whether this target is expressed in the cell type that you're studying. If your target is poorly expressed, increase the quantity of DNA used for the amplification. Alternatively, you could do pre-amplification steps to increase the expression of your target. And to do this, commercial kits are available. You can also do qPCR on crude cell lysates instead of purified RNA samples to avoid losing material. Besides knowing if your primers are efficient, a standard curve tells you the detection limit. This can help you determine the appropriate amount of DNA to use in your experiments. Why use 10 nanograms of DNA per reaction when you can get good amplification at 1 nanogram? That way, you can spare your precious DNA samples for more qPCR reactions. So that's it for qPCR standard curves. Check out the episode description for links to related articles and resources, and don't forget to subscribe to the podcast to get more help and advice from mentors at your bench side.